I think the CFP for, for this talk said something about um, trying to think of, think of a, a funny or interesting title for your talk. So uh, I came up with this. <laughs> I think I nailed it. <laughs> Pretty pleased, actually. But uh, it should give you some idea of the, what the kind of talk it is. Um, I'm Carl. Um, in the past, I've done a lot of um, .NET. Uh, um, <laughs> Yeah, it kind of goes hand in hand, doesn't it? <laughs> um, distributed systems, but we all know it's really hard on anything else but the beam, right? <laughs> it's hard on the beam as well. Um, one thing I did do, I, I implemented Raft uh, already in, in, in F Sharp a few, a few years back. So Raft is, you know, has been a, an opportunity for me to kind of apply some of the things that I learned or some of the things I got wrong um, so I could get them wrong again. Um, just a side note, it uh, might be interesting for, 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 for the audience. Um, I'm the author of Fez. Uh, Fez is a, an F sharp to, to, to Core Erlang or, or Beam um, compiler experiment that um, you can check out if you like uh, alternative languages on the Beam. Uh, yeah, it's, it's an experiment. I've got a Twitter handle, uh, you can abuse me as well. Um, as already said, I work for Pivotal on the RabbitMQ team. So I work on the RabbitMQ messaging broker. As uh, If you're familiar with it, you probably know it's written in Erlang. Oh, I should start my timer. Um, Pivotal su um, supports the RabbitMQ development and provides a variety of RabbitMQ services. So this talk is not going to be so much about Raft. I think we're just going to try to squeeze in as much about Raft, the algorithm, which is a distributed, uh, it's a consensus algorithm, um, and talk more about Ra. What the library, what, what it provides, how you can use it, that kind of thing. We're going to do a demo. <laughs> um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about RabbitMQ, mostly in the context on how it informed some of the design decisions inside RA and some of the uh, priorities that we assigned certain things inside, inside RA. But first, I would like to talk about gen servers. I'm sure you've heard of them, um, at least I hope. Um, I mean, they, they are, there are many things. There are many things that are good about gen servers. They are, I think they're very easy, easy to reason about because they do provide you with this um, simple concurrency model, right? You know, messages come in, you process them one by one in order, right? Typically, unless you've got some funky gen servers going on. Um, they're stateful, so you can ma maintain state, change state. Um, and they've got a very simple API, right? You, you can you typically wrap it around one or, one or two options. Do you either cast or you call synchronously into the gen server and get a reply. So that's really good. Uh, there's a few things that they're, they're definitely not. Um, they're not replicated. So you can't have multiple gen servers simply running um, as a cluster, uh, but presenting a front as if they were a single gen server. Um, so they're not fault tolerant. You don't have what, you automatically have a gen server take over if one crashes. And they're not persistent. So if, if they crash, you know, your, your, your state is gone, right? Unless you persisted it to some external data storage, which has its own set of <laughs> distributed system problems, of course. Um, when you restart, when you supervise restart you, that, you know, it doesn't get you back to the same state. So RA, uh, by virtue of being a Raft implementation, we're not, we're not inventing anything new here, um, allows us to implement persistent, replicated, and it should say fault tolerant, to a point state machines. When we talk about a state machine, we don't, in the context of RA and Raft, we don't, we're not really talking about like a gen statum kind of state machines where you've got a fixed set of, of name state that you kind of move between. It's more about, the, it's more like a left fold <laughs> where you have a, a command and a state and you apply it and you return a new state and you do that to a to a sequence or log of entries, right? So to a list. Um, so that's kind of more what we're talking about. It's kind of, it's kind of written in ML style language, but it's, a, it's an apply function with two arguments returning a, a state. So let's try to squeeze Raft in really, really quickly. Um, Raft replicates entries through a log. So in a Raft cluster, you would have a leader and you would have some followers. 
and the leader would accept some command being, being issued to it, and it would append it to its log persistently, um, and making sure that it puts it all the way down to reliable storage, which effectively means F-sync. You have to F-sync before you can do anything. And it replicates it to the followers, and they do exactly the same thing. They put it on, into, onto their logs, and once, um, once more than half of the cluster size have seen this particular entry in the log, then that is considered safe and will be applied to the state machine. So it will be applied to the in-memory state that the leader and the followers is holding, just like the previous function would have worked. Uh, so it's a quorum system. That's what we mean, a quorum. You need a quorum of votes um, to confirm back to say that they got the entry. And it's got a leader election process so that um, if a leader crashes, a follower can take over. And this election process is safe. That's an important thing. That's where a lot of distributed um, replication algorithms go wrong, is that the, the, the failover isn't safe. Uh, a, a, a follower with a stale state could become leader, and Ralph guarantees us that's not the case. So there's a little uh, three-node cluster here. You can see the leader's got a log. They, they all got logs. They all come. A um, little bit of a condensed draft state there. We've got a commit index, and we've got a state, which is an empty list, and we get this key value kind of type of command, put key one and v. Um, the first thing the leader does is uh, it depends it to, to the log and gives it an index of one. Then it replicates it using this um, append entries RPC message to its followers. One of these followers appends to, uh, it to its log, the other follower we can pretend that's running slow or didn't see the message, it doesn't matter. And then the follower replies back saying, I've, I've successfully appended and F-synced your entries to my log, and now more than half of the cluster has seen this entry. So the leader runs his state machine code, whatever that is, and increments his commit index to one, runs his state, ma state machine code, and then ends up with a new state, which has got this key value pair inside the list. So that's, at that point, you know, the command has been fully processed and you can return to the caller saying, okay, we've done it. So that's kind of the very, very quick basics of Raft. Hopefully that will be enough to take us through the next uh, section. There's lots and lots of really good resources about Raft. That's what I don't want to go into much, too much detail anyway. Right. So using Raft to make a key value store, because that's what you do, right? That's a hello world of, of <laughs> distributed... Uh, uh, replicated state machines. Um, you have to first implement a behavior, because that's how we run in Erlang. Um, the RAM machine behavior, it's going to got two required callbacks. It's got the init of one callback, which takes a configuration and returns the initial state of the state machine. So that's like uh, the initial state before you started applying any commands to it. And then we've got apply for, which has got a couple of extra arguments compared to the apply function we saw earlier, but um, a kind of more for advanced use, um, it does the same thing. It applies a command to the state machine and returns a new state, an updated state. So that's our state machine. There's a few rules around uh, apply for that you have to adhere to if you're gonna be successful <laughs> or correct. Um, so it must be deterministic. So if you run the state machine over a, a set of, um, an order set of commands, you should arrive, always arrive at the same end state, exactly the same end state, every time. So that means that you can't perform side effects inside apply for. Um, so you can't send messages, uh, well you can, but you shouldn't. Uh, you can't throw exceptions, um, you can't perform ETS, DTS operations, or write to the file system, or read from the file system, or the network, or create references, that's not safe to do, that's not deterministic. If you run that multiple times, you're gonna end up with new references every time. Whereas remember, they also run on each of the nodes, both leaders and followers execute the same commands. So, yeah, none of that, pure code, right? Pure functional code, we, which we like. Um, and then we're gonna typically implement um, a client API, so we're gonna implement put, delete, and get. we're not gonna do delete, but it's put and get. And then we start a, uh, a cluster of RAS servers using uh, RAS start cluster. <laughs> uh, and um, 
one thing to note there is um, RAS servers in a, in a RAS cluster are always locally named, locally registered processes, so they have a local name. And uh, in the cluster, they're referred to by their name and the node they're running on, the Erlang node. And then we're going to send some commands using RAR process command 2 to interact with the, uh, with the RAR cluster. And we're going to open up a server and have a little look around, just try to start building a bit of intuition about how the system behaves and what happens on each node and how we can use it. So hopefully that sounds OK. Right, OK. I hope you can see that OK. Um, this is not Elixir. <laughs> <laughs> Some other language that, uh, I don't know, wizard and witches only write. Um, but in our implementation here, we've got um, a module. We call it KV for key value store, right? It's a good name. And we implement the raw machine behavior. Uh, the raw machine behavior implementation, uh, as I mentioned al already, has only got two, two functions, two, two required callbacks that we need to implement. Uh, a client API is going to be very simple. It's going to be put and get, so we can put new keys, key value pairs, and we can, we can get them. And then we're going to have some cluster management uh, bits to start the cluster. We're going to have a little helper to do that. And we're also going to do um, uh, replace a member whilst the cluster is running. So we're actually going to change the configuration of the of the RAR cluster uh, as it's running, because that's another thing that RAR provides and I wanted to show. Hopefully we'll get time to do that. So I'm going to scroll down a little bit because I, I know it's a little bit hard to see at the back when things are really far down on the screen. <coughs> So the uh, raw machine implementation in it, very simple. Um, for our key value store, we're going to uh, represent uh, that the, the, inside the uh, raw machine implementation as a map, right? That makes sense. It's a key value store. Um, so it takes some configuration that we ignore and we return an empty map. So that's our initial state, right? Then as entries are appended to the log and applied, uh, they will eventually call apply for. Um, the first argument there is a metadata map, which contains some metadata around the raft index, uh, the raft, like raft related metadata. We're, we're just going to ignore it for this demo. Then this is our command that we that we send in, that's been appended to the log and replicated and then eventually applied. So put of a key of, and a value. <clears throat> then we've got this um, effects thing. It's a list. Um, we're just going to ignore it for now. We're just using it so we can round trip it. I'm going to talk through what it is uh, a little bit later, but for now we're still ignore it. And we've got a state, and our state, when we receive our first commands, will be that empty map we returned in the, in the init. And then we've got a very similar thing here for get. Um, actually, let's go through the return value, because that's kind of important as well. So our return uh, value from the apply function needs to be a triple, or a tuple of three, arity to three. The first item will be the updated <coughs> state, so we'd simply just put our map there, so that, that would return our state in our first position. Then, then some effects, so we just round trip what we've got there. And this is a reply to the caller, if there is a caller waiting, indeed. Um, so that could be anything. In this instance, we just chose to use the, um, the atom inserted. So similar for get, instead of uh, just returning some default atom, we're returning the actual result from getting the item out of the state. OK? Right, the client API is uh, similarly very simple, very simple wrapper around raw process command. It takes a server ID, so this is our, this is our kind of name, tup, name node tuple, and the command that we want to send. Okay, and that will, this is a synchronous invocation, like we, talked, like we showed earlier, it will go through the whole replication process, and then it will apply it, and only then will it re return uh, with the result, hopefully suc successful. Uh, get, very similar there. Um, the cluster API, <clears throat> so um, I've got a, a four-node Erlang cluster running here, and um, we're just going to start it, um, give, it, give it a name, give the cluster a name, because um, RA allows you to start multiple, multiple clusters um, within an Erlang cluster, um, and a list of nodes that we want them to run on, we create some server IDs, just from uh, the nodes and the name. So they will, will all have the same name on the, on the cluster. Um, then we create a machine config. 
which effectively just tells Ra where our Ra machine implementation is at and what configuration we want to pass it uh, initially. So we just pass an empty map from now <clears throat> and it's implemented in the current module. So we just use this um, macro for that. And then we call start cluster with a name, the machine config, and the list of initial members or the server IDs. I'm not going to go through replace members. We're just going to see how that works. OK. So right, let's see. So I've got a, a, a four node Erlang cluster here, all connected. So we've got uh, a top left. That's going to be our control node, X <laughs> it's called. Um, <clears throat> we're going to issue all the commands in there. All these just going to spit out log entries. So um, A, B, and C, uh, they're called. So um, although we will name the RAR cluster, um, I prob might just refer to individual RAR servers as they know they're running on, because we're just going to have one. OK. So let's start a new, oh, not that, uh, new RAR cluster using KB start. And we're just going to call it Berlin, because that's where we are, I think, and give it a list of nodes. So nodes will return A, B, and C in this instance. OK, so we've got some log entries. So that's good. Um, our return value here is a triple of OK, because it worked OK. And then a list of um, raw servers that got started. So it's, luckily, that was all of them. And then it was also returns a list of raw, nodes, raw servers that weren't started, in case one of them weren't available. Um, for a successful start, you just just like most quorum systems, you just need a quorum of nodes to be available to start successfully and be able to, um, to send commands. OK, uh, now we can, um, so I'm going to pick any of the nodes. I'm not going to pick, you see, the log entry above uh, where I'm highlighting at the moment. It says leader is the Berlin node at, on the A node. Uh, I'm going to choose to address uh, C instead. Um, and I'm going to send key one value one. OK, so I'm just going to insert key one, value one. OK, so in our return tuple here, we've got OK, because the command uh, process successful. That's what that means. They went through the consensus, replicated, and returned successfully. The second item in the tuple is the return value from the state machine, so inserted. And the last item is the current leader. So it's transparently redirect us to the leader because we addressed a non-leader node or a follower node. Uh, but the follower knows who the leader is, so it just handled that for us. And then every time you interact with Ra, it will tell you who the current leader is in case it changes because that might be transparent to you so that you always can kind of track where the leader is at. Um, right. So now, so we put a key in there. Now let's, um, let's open up... Uh, Observer. OK, I'm going to try to zoom in. So if you then look on the A node, we can see this is the um, supervision hierarchy of Ra. Um, so you've got lots of <coughs> bits of infrastructure there, not, maybe not so interesting. But you've got this uh, Ra server sub. And under that, we've got our Berlin node. Um, if we open that up and have a look at the state representation for that, um, we can see this is the leader node. Um, it's got some cluster configuration here. Got some raft related things here. A log, obviously, it's got some log state as well. Uh, and this is our machine state here. So you can see we've got a, <coughs> um, a single key and value in there at the moment. Uh, and if we uh, just switch to any node, we should have the same state. Right, right. So they're all agreed on this value. They all have it, or enough here, at least. Right. So now I'm going to take B down. And I'm going to address A with a new key insert. OK, so that proves that even with a single follower node uh, unavailable, we can still insert entries and have availability uh, of, uh, of the cluster. I'm going to take C down as well. 
I'm going to try to write K3 to A. A is still, still up and running. <coughs> what will happen? We'll time out. Because you can't achieve consensus. More than half of the nodes in the cluster, or the servers in the cluster, are unavailable. So it's not able to process this command. Or at least it's indeterminate, right? There's no, there's no Booleans in distributed <coughs> systems. It's just yes or don't know. Um, so I'm going to bring node B back. And so by default, when you uh, bring the application up, nodes up, uh, servers that were running on it aren't automatically started. You have to kind of perform that some, as a manual action at the moment. I think it will be a reasonable improvement in the future to have that as an optional feature. But we're going to restart B. So now, again, we should be able to write another key. And now, yeah, now we've restored availability because, again, we've got a quorum. Let's have a quick look in, uh, in Observer on node A, for example. State, right. This is our current state. It still wrote, it still managed to commit key three, K3, which we wrote whilst um, we were in a minority. We weren't able to actually uh, process that command. So it still had it. The leader still had it in its log. And once it had a quorum back up again, it was able to replicate it. Um, but obviously, it, we timed out before we, we could wait for that to happen. Right. Now, let's start. Let's start C back up again, and let's start the server on C as well. So we should re uh, recover back at a, a fully working three-node uh, RAR cluster. Let's take the leader down. OK, the leader is gone. So now, those of you can, who can see the log entries down here might, have, uh, might spot that the uh, C node has now become leader. So we should be able to then address any of the up nodes to write another key. So let's address B, for example. And that's right. So we, we, we still regained availability. So that's when it ran. It detected that um, A had gone down. It very quickly held an election and elected a new node leader. So C is now the leader down here. So let's take uh, B down as well. Oh, no, that's not at all what I intended to do. Sorry. Reversing. OK. OK. So, right. B is back. We've still, we still got a, a functioning cluster. Let's take the leader down. Right. So now we only got B running down there in the bottom left. Um, these two are dead. And it's keep printing out this pre-vote election phase because it's trying to become leader. It knows there's no leader. It knows the leader crashed. But there isn't a quorum because you need a quorum of votes in order to become leader, um, and it's not able to. So uh, it has to wait for another node to come back up again before an election can be successfully held. Let's take that one down again. So now we don't have any nodes running. We're just going to restart all the, uh, uh, all the Erlang nodes, and then we're going to restart the entire cluster. It's a bit tedious having to do this. So I think I might go and implement that feature next. Uh, restart server, so we've got A there, it's only A running, it's in this pre-vote phase, B and C. So now we've got, again, got a, a functioning cluster. If we then go back to uh, Observer and click through all these alerts, it will spit out of Um A, go to A, we can look at the state. Right, okay. So as you can see, it's recovered back at the original, at the state we were in. So that's how we kind of show that it's, it is persistent. OK, right, so I think you know, we've gone through a fair bit of the kind of semantics or what you can, you know, the kind of things that you can be, uh, expect here. Let's see if we can start, we can change the, um, the cluster configuration. So uh, we're going to use this uh, KV replace member. Um, which one is the current leader? Yes. B. OK, B 
So we're going to address B, and we're going to tell B we want to change. We want to remove one of the nodes. We're going to remove. We're going to remove C. Now we don't want C anymore. C is going to be deprecated or it's going to be taken down. The server is not running well, and we're going to replace it with a node running on the control node X. So we use this replace member. It does issue a few raw commands from the raw module, but um, um, we won't go through them in detail. We just don't have time. OK, so we ran that. Um, it looks like it was pretty successful. Um, if we now look at node C, we can see there's no longer a, a, a process named Berlin running on that node. That was shut down. And uh, instead, we got one running on X. So we've reconfigured our membership, reconfigured our cluster whilst the cluster was running. And this reconfiguration also is safe. It's also based on the log. <laughs> I like that, yeah, yes. Um, right, OK, so I think that's that's end of the demo, thankfully. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so now, now it's just me talking left, yeah. Um, so hopefully we've now seen that Bra provides replication and data safety um, in the, using this leader follower kind of topology um, and fault tolerance, right? Followers can crash without affecting availability, at least to a point. We've seen, we, and we've seen where that point, where the, when the, where the tipping point is. Um, I've shown persistence, so we can recover the state machine to where we, where we were at before we shut the entire cluster down. Uh, you've seen the leader election process several times, hopefully. Um, the leader election ensures that we get high availability, right? Because everything needs to go through the leader. So we need to elect a leader very quickly once the leader goes down. And we've seen dynamic membership changes. So we can reconfigure the cluster uh, at runtime. And hopefully, you've seen a little bit of Raft as a library in Erlang. Um, I do think the API is, is relatively deep and relatively simple, at least you know, to this point. So um, I, don't, I, I would struggle to make it simpler than that. I think then it would be oversimplistic. So yeah, hopefully it's, it's simple enough to, be, to get started. And then we'll see when you end up in the pit of despair <laughs> afterwards. But yeah, this might be the pit of despair, actually. Um, the async API. So we've, we've seen the synchronous API, where you effectively the call equivalent, right? Um, we also have RA pipeline command where you can asynchronously send lots and lots of commands to uh, a RA server and then have some sort of either ignore it completely or have some asynchronous notification with the correlation ID that gets run tripped to make, you know, and then you have to do your own bookkeeping to make sure that the, all the commands that you sent actually get correlated back and that kind of thing. But you kind of need this API for throughput, right? Because otherwise you can't just, you know, it's, it's, it's quite high latency doing a single call into that system, because obviously you've got file system, replication, all that stuff that needs to happen before it returns back to you. So this API is needed, but it is more complex. Uh, and there's stuff you have to do to maintain ordering and ensure you don't lose messages, but there are ways of doing all those things. One thing we didn't see, although we kind of hinted at it, is how do we make the raw machine, if it's, you know, if the raw state machine is, you know, a pure function, which it is, uh, a, a data transform, if you like, um, and deterministic. How, um, how can we make it do, th do stuff <laughs> in the real world, right? How can we make it have effects on the outside environment? Um, so the way we do that is through that effects argument. It's a list of effects, and we effect an effect is effectively, effectively something that um, it describes a side effect as data, right? And by doing so, we can then implement the system such that the effects are only actioned by the leader and not by all nodes, because all nodes run the same commands, right? So that's why we can't send messages inside the apply function, because we will get the number of node messages back at, back at us. So there's a variety of effects that uh, the raw machine uh, it currently supports. Um, the send message effect, which takes a PID and a message, and it sends the message to the PID. <laughs> uh, but it only does it on the, um, on the leader node. And what's important to note is that it uses Erlang send with no connect and no suspend. Uh, and if you know what they mean, that's kind of the least reliable way of sending a message that is available. 
And it only does this because it doesn't want to block, right? If you don't have no connect and a node is disconnected, uh, an Erlang node is disconnected, it will try to reconnect, right? So it will go through the whole TCP thing, right? And that's, that, could, that is enough to block a node um, for some time, and it does affect throughput. So um, it's, it's something to bear in mind. You have to implement your own reliability protocol on top of it, but that's always kind of going to be the case anyway, if you really think about it. Um, Modcall, if you don't like that, you can use Modcall, which calls any function in, you know, in any module. Um, again, you should avoid to throw, because that will just crash the system. Um, and also, you should avoid to block, because again, RA is a single process. It will affect throughput if you, don't, if you, if you, if you regularly block the process uh, inside the process. And then you can monitor processes and nodes, on behind, you know, and it will, it will send back a command to you. It will go through the log. Everything that goes into the state machine needs to go through the log. So if you ask it to monitor a process and that process goes down, it will commit a down command into the log, and that, you will have to handle that in your state machine implementation, just like all the other commands. And then down here, and I, it's probably good that you can't see it at the back because it's called the release cursor effect. It's to do with how the snapshotting is triggered inside RA. I don't really have time to actually go through it in a lot of detail. So you can catch me afterwards if you're really interested in snapshotting. Right. Ten minutes. Design. Why would we write our own? There are alternatives out there. Why, don't, why not just pick, up, pick something up out of the uh, open source, uh, massive open source bucket? Um, well, it was very important for us to, um, well, our target was to see if it was possible to write an efficient, safe queue implementation on top of something like Raft. Um, so we needed control and we needed a, a platform to experiment on. And also, if it kind of becomes something that we could use, we needed to really understand this code base, like really, like through and through. So that's, I think, is probably good enough reason to write your own. And we also had design requirements from RabbitMQ that we needed to meet. Um, so if one, so we were considering like having one RAR cluster representing a single queue in RabbitMQ. Now, RabbitMQ supports many thousands of queues like until your memory runs out. So we needed to be able to spawn thousands of these inside a RAR cluster, so inside an Erlang cluster. So we kind of needed them to be really li as lightweight, light, lightweight as we could and uh, use a minimal number of processes um, they needed to be in pure Erlang because um, RabbitMQ core is a sort of pure, pure Erlang, you know, uh, and, and we want to keep it that way. Um, we needed to use distributed Erlang so we couldn't open additional ports because that becomes a kind of configuration deployment nightmare very quickly. So, yeah, there were, there were, there were things that we needed to meet. So that's why we decided to write our own. Initially, we wanted it to be an OTP library so we can embed it in an existing supervision hierarchy and not have like a, an application dependencies. But um, in the initial design, every RAS server had their own log file that they wrote to. You know, it's this kind of simplest, simplest first cut implementation that we could. And it provided reasonable throughput, but um, only if you ran a single server on every Erlang node. Once you scaled up and ran a few, a few servers, even like just a dozen servers, um, it started falling over and, and it basically ground to a, a, an extreme halt. It, um, yeah, it really, really crashed. Um, and that was pretty much all down to F-Sync contention. Because every time we get a command, right, we need to F-Sync. It needs to be on disk before we can apply it to the state machine. And all these RAS servers, or all these processes were all F-Syncing to the same disk volume and you've got contention there on the disk. Basically. Sim simple disk contention issue. And it, it was just latency was just creeping up massively and it, it just became a nightmare. So we realized we needed to centralize access to critical resources like the file system uh, and control it. Um, and that's when we kind of dropped the OTP library requirement and introduced a bit of uh, infrastructure for the log first. So we kind of have a, like a write ahead log like process where all RAL servers send all their writes to, all the commands that come in, they send them asynchronously to this process that then flushes them to disk in, in, in batches, uh, uh, dynamic, dynamically sized batches, and then it responds asynchronously to the writers uh, when it's F-synced everything to disk. 
Um, at the same time, all these entries, whilst they're in the write ahead log, they're also in ETS, so they can be read very, very, very quickly uh, rather than having to go to disk. Uh, this kind of infrastructure is very much inspired by log structured merge tree um, storage engines like LevelDB. Once a write ahead log fills up, um, it passes its log to a segment writer process that then kind of flushes, um, flushes the in memory tables to disk. Uh, as segmented files um, per RAS server. So then that's when kind of we fan out into each of the RAS servers and they get their own, own disk files. Uh, but they very rarely read from them in practice. In a good functioning system, they very rarely read from disk. Um, one difference from LSM trees is that we, um, we never need to do compaction. I don't know if you uh, know much about the log structures and merge trees, but they sometimes have to recompact all the, all the different uh, segment files, and that's quite, that in, introduces quite a lot of write, write amplification on the system. We don't need to do that because when we truncate the log, we can just delete the whole segments instead. So there's a little bit of a win there because all our keys, if we think of it like as a key value store, all our keys are incremented and ordered by default. They don't need to be ordered separately. And then we've got a snapshot writer process. Again, I'm going to ignore snapshotting for now. Fault detection. Vanilla Raft uses the uh, replication message as a heartbeat as well. So uh, even if it doesn't have anything, yeah, anything to uh, replicate, it sends an empty message in order to keep followers from timing out and starting elections and potentially disrupting the, the stability of the cluster. Um, that wasn't really feasible when you're running thousands of these clusters inside an airline cluster because it's just too chatty. Too chatty, too much, too much communications. Every 50 milliseconds, every server, you know, it just, it just adds up. So uh, instead, we kind of uh, Erlangified it by using Erlang monitors. Uh, so followers monitor the leaders. Uh, so that works obviously works really well for no downs and process crashes where the TCP connection goes down, and we regularly, you know, detect it and, and in, a, in a timely manner, like we saw in the demo. <clears throat> but I'm, I'm sure those of you have had, ever had network partition behavior that you've had to deal with and uh, knows that that's, a, you know, that's where the problem lies. The, the kind of detecting when, a, when, a, when a, a leader potentially is in a minority network partition. So it's still up, the, uh, the TCP connection is still up, but it can't, it can't make progress. So for that, we've, um, we've got a separate library that we also wrote. Um, it's an implementation of, uh, of an uh, adaptive failure detection algorithm. Uh, it's called Atten. Uh, you can check it out as well. It's a useful little tool. It's a, quite a simple little application. Uh, um, and it provides timely hints of Erlang nodes. So it just monitors the Erlang node. So if you follow a follow up request of Atten that it wants to know when an Erlang node, the Erlang node where the leader is running, is, appears unavailable. Right? And it gives, you, it gives the followers a hint, and then the followers can move on to create an election, the election is safe anyway, it, they might just bail out very early if it was like a false positive, but if it's, a, if it's an actual detection, then they will quickly proceed and, and uh, re -get, restore availability if possible. Right, okay. So in RabbitMQ, uh, Ra is going to be used in a new queue type called the quorum queue <laughs> because of its quorum behavior. <laughs> um, to save us writing documentation. <laughs> it's in the name. <laughs> it will ship as an optional feature in version 3.8, hopefully next year. Uh, we've tested it quite a lot. Um, Jepson, May, uh, anyone heard of Jepson? Good, 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 good. A few people. So it's like a fault injection framework written by Carl Kingsbury. Uh, so we've got a raw key, key, key value store very similar to what we implemented uh, today. Um, that's, um, it's got an HTTP front and it's running a very similar Jepson test suites to uh, etcd, if you've heard of that key value store in Go, used everywhere. Um, so that's a separate project, but we, we did find bugs with that, uh, gnarly bugs. And we've, it now passes. We can't get it to fail, so that's that's a good th a good sign. We've also forked the original RabbitMQ Jepson test, which RabbitMQ failed <laughs> quite horribly. Um, <laughs> Subject for another talk, actually. But um, <clears throat> uh, again, we found bugs with that, and it, it now passes. 
so it, we have some confidence that we've at least fixed the most obvious, obvious bugs. It will also be tested inside RabbitMQ because it will be part of RabbitMQ. And I think maturing a consensus uh, implementation is hard because it takes time testing an application. I think inside RabbitMQ, which is so widely used, uh, it's, it's got an excellent opportunity there. Uh, <laughs> there are some other uses that we're experimenting with, something called Mnevis, which is an experimental replication transaction layer for amnesia. <laughs> so rather than using a am replicated amnesia, it uses Ra to replicate the transaction messages and stuff. Uh, it's quite interesting. It breaks all the rules that we've... Uh, <laughs> so we're still va validating that approach, but it might be something worth keeping an eye on if, you, if you've got an amnesia implementation that you don't like. Currently, we say we put a, an arbitrary... No, not arbitrary. We say it's a 0.9. <laughs> um, because the API is settled. The API is very unlikely to change unless we get some really good feedback to say that it should change uh, before 1.0. Uh, at 1.0, we'll apply semantic versioning to the RAM module, which is all the main interactions are done in RAM module, the RAM machine behavior, and the on-disk data formats, which are versioned anyway, so we can change them. Um, in the future, we might do some of these things, but we're running out of time. If anyone uh, yeah, has any comments on these, please grab me. And that's it, thank you. I nearly made it on time. <laughs> nearly. <laughs> I actually don't know if you agree with me, but this execution of the live demo was like one of the best I have seen in my life. <laughs> like, really? I mean, I was watching like a live demo in Erlang, which is a language that's usually very hard for me to, to follow, and I was following super easily, and like nothing was going wrong. So oh, thank that's you. really good to hear. Thank you. So, any questions? We have a place for one question. One you question. Have to Okay, well, <laughs> I think you, were, you had your hand up slightly earlier there in the back. Uh, so, uh, in your demo, you showed that you're basically uh, dispatching command to like a random RA server. Yep. And how would you actually choose the uh, server to send the command to? Randomly is a good way. If you, know, if you know the cluster size, choose a random one, and then in the first command that you issue, if it's a synchronous command, you will be told who the leader actually is, and then you just use that, track that leader from that. That's where we always return it. Uh -huh so that you can track it in case it changes, because it could change, right? Okay, Anytime. My question was actually related to it. Just yeah. stick, well, it. stick it in, stick uh, it in. Uh, <laughs> what, what is if the node, 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 uh, node uh, is not available? So for example, eight But then you, then you get a timeout, and you should probably try the next one in your ah, list of... Yeah, you should try it. Yeah, just keep trying. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions, just grab me. I'm, I'm more than happy to talk about this. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Carl.